One of the poems that I want to start with is, um, it's a poem about the BBC television programme for young children called The Clangers. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with The Clangers. Um, I watched it as a child, but I find it slightly creepy. I think, um, I mean, Oliver Postgate is the man who's responsible for the clangers, and he wrote it and directed it, and in my, you know, he did the whole thing. And he also did Bagpuss, and he also did Ivor the Engine. He was, he was a huge stalwart of BBC programming for young children. And it, there is something a bit creepy about all of those programs, I think. Um, and I didn't quite like it when I was a child, but a friend of mine had found... Um, a, a, a video of the clangers going for like 3p in a charity mm. shop and he'd bought it and he was introducing his daughter to the clangers from when he was a child and he said to me oh the clangers are amazing you have to come round to my house and watch the clangers so I watched the first episode and immediately thought oh this is just I mean I don't even need to write the poem I just need to write it down because the narrative was it was it was so strange and otherworldly and beautifully written and um, and about big things. It seemed to be very philosophical to me and, um, and unpredictable. And all those qualities made me want to kind of capture the essence of the clangers. So I'm going to start with the poem called The Clangers. Um, and it's for my friend Gerald Boyle, who suggested that I watch them again. So it's all in the voice of the narrator. It's all in the voice, really, of Oliver Postgate. The Clangers for Gerald Boyle. This planet, this cloudy planet, is the Earth. We cannot guess how flawed and insignificant it is unless we travel in our imaginations to another star, to another stone-pocked sphere without atmosphere where an orderly people, curious and conciliatory, stares out across the vast and silent territory of intergalactic space, dreaming of otherness, which arrived once in the shape of an iron chicken they cobbled together from sky detritus. It couldn't understand its own coordinates and blundered all over the meteor garden until tiny clangor, there now, there, calmed it into submission like a hoarse whisperer. As thanks it laid an iron egg before flapping away to its spiky nest. The egg was filled with staves, which tiny clangor planted and watched turn into music trees. On other star-bright days, when otherness fails to visit them, the clangers resort to flying machines to snatch whatever passing implement or instrument they can. Flying machines are major clangers' passion. It is the randomness of sky fishing that excites him. A functioning television set or a hat with live inhabitants. Whatever the harvest is, it must be clamorously exhibited for the benefit of everyone, then taken on a trolley to the soup dragon. Inside the clangor planet, there are caves and caves and caves full of flowers, and only the glow buzzers know they are there at all. Small clangor got lost once, like all the countless dead before Theseus, following the glow buzzers to the glow honey source. At first he didn't notice, the caves an enticement of pearly lights and unexpected airiness, the flowers a theatre, while Granny Clanger nodded over her knitting, he was bowing to each extraordinary face in turn. Eventually, the glow buzzers led him out again. Goodbye, Clangers, that stretched and iridescent shoal of stars and dark between your world and ours is beckoning. Tuck yourselves into bed, fold your ears over your eyes, Whistle your singing kettle breath one last time. Does anyone here know um, Thackeray's Vanity Fair? Yes? Um, well, it's my favourite 19th century novel. I absolutely love it. Um, and for those of you who don't know the novel, it's, it's, 
it's kind of constructed around two opposite women, and, and one is Amelia, and she is the 19th century archetype of the good woman, the good wife. She's pious, she's meek, she's submissive. Um, she's not very original, she doesn't have a lot of colour. And her friend, um, Becky Sharp, who is an anathema to all of those things, and she's wild and clever and irreverent and immoral and um, the best creation, I think, in, in English 19th century fiction. And the story is that uh, Amelia, Amelia falls in love and marries a man who's a cad, and he gets killed two weeks later at the Battle of Waterloo. Um, leaving her pregnant, and she has a son, and she names her son after this man who's called George. So her son is called George. And she kind of, like Queen Victoria did, she seals herself off in widowhood for over a decade and worships her husband's portrait and blah, 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 blah. Her husband's best friend is a character called William Dobbin, and um, he's been in love with Amelia since he first set eyes on her, and he is really the hero of the book, but he's totally undersung. And he becomes her best friend, and she um, is quite happy for him to be her best friend and look after her and support her and her son, but she's, she's not romantically interested in William Dobbin. And after about 15 years, they have a fight over Becky Sharp because William Dobbin doesn't like her, and she's defending her friend. And, um, and he suddenly says to her, you know what? <laughs> um, you're not worthy of my great attachment and I have wasted 15 years of my life and I'm going and I'm going to meet someone who's going to give me the love that I deserve and off he goes um, and of course at this moment Amelia falls madly in love with William Dobbin realises what she's ignored in his wonderful character for 15 years and um, is stricken with remorse that he's, he's gone and she's lost this chance so in the novel she writes a letter and he's gone back to England, she's in Belgium. She writes a letter and we never see what the letter is. We're just told that she writes it in the middle of the night, she posts it, and the consequence is that he comes back and they meet and they marry and, and that's really the end of the book. So I was thinking, well, what did she say? <laughs> so I decided to write the letter. Um, so this is in Amelia's voice and it's the letter that she writes to William Dobbin. And I also was thinking, because to try and capture the 19th century, I was thinking, well, what poetic form would be appropriate for the formal style of a letter in the 19th century? And I wrote it in, in rhyming couplets for that reason. So. OK. Vanity Fair. Dearest William, I could begin by hoping you are well in England, and I do, now that the mth regiment has returned to Chatham. Or I could begin by telling you that reports of worsening weather here are true, that Georgie thinks you wicked and unkind for leaving him, that your former servants pine, or that father, though no better, is no worse, etc. But this is not a weather talk sort of letter. It is after three, the whole house sleeps, even Becky, and I am kept awake six weeks by your crippling absence. An irony, I confess, since for all your years of passionate presence, I failed to cherish you. Now that you're gone, Becky, and you were right about her all along, keeps dreadful company. Boorish men who jest and drink and flirt, and she isn't in the slightest shocked by any of it. I keep to my room. I have placed the portrait of George face down on the dresser. I have folded the gloves you left in an innermost drawer as though they were a gift. Since you spoke of my incapacity for love, I have come to see how my own fierce widowhood was a shell against the world, a kind of carapace made up of pride, stupidity and cowardice, a stay, if you will, against the kind of attachment such as yours for me deserved. Poor shredded raiment, for if it did not keep me warm, it kept me safe, safe against you and safe against myself. Last year at the opera, it was Dido and Aeneas. I wished to take your hand in a sudden, artless, harmless way that would not give you pause, 
then didn't. I think I must have sensed the charge built up from a decade's loving in your fingers, though there you sat as solid as an anchor, and feared that touching it would knock me flat. Now I'm scared I shall die without it. Dear Dobbin, come back. Like everything else we do in our mingled, muddy lives, this letter is overdue. Forgive me if my love arrives belatedly, but there is a ship can get you here by Friday and come all the rain in Christendom. I shall be waiting for you by the viewing platform. Dearest William, put out to sea. Yours, Amelia Sedley. Thank you.